Welcome to the World War I History Podcast, produced by the MacArthur Memorial. We invite you to follow us on Twitter, at MacArthur1880, or find the General Douglas MacArthur Memorial on Facebook. Sergeant York Alvin York is a man that many Americans are familiar with. He was a man committed to nonviolence, and yet his actions on a battlefield in France during World War I proved that he was a proficient warrior. His heroism in that war made him a celebrity, and in 1940, Warner Brothers made a movie about his story. The film, starring Gary Cooper, was released in 1941. It was in theaters when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor and as the nation steeled itself for another world war. Recent York biographer Douglas V. Mastriano argues that this timing of the film forever enshrined York as the ideal American hero. In essence, York became the bridge between America's colonial past and the World War II generation. He personified the Minutemen ideals of the farmer-soldier of the American Revolution by putting down his plow to take up his rifle. This romantic ideal is portrayed in the film, but like most Hollywood versions of history, the film captures just part of the story. Alvin York was born on December 13, 1887, in rural Tennessee near Jamestown County seat. His family lived in a one-room cabin on a 75-acre farm. The land was difficult to work, and to earn additional income, York's father also operated a blacksmith shop on the property. As soon as York was old enough to walk, he helped his mother with the other children. At the age of six, he began working in the fields and assisted in the blacksmith shop. He also went hunting with his father, learning to track game and to use a muzzle-loaded rifle. Like many children in the county, between harvests and other work, he attended school about one month per year. By the age of 18, he had a third-grade education. In 1911, his father died from complications after being kicked by a mule. At 23 years of age, York was suddenly responsible for the welfare of the family, in addition to running the family farm and the blacksmith shop. To escape these enormous pressures, he began to frequent blind tigers, bars built on the Tennessee-Kentucky state line where moonshine was served. Of these bars, York later said, Sodom and Gomorrah might have been bigger places, but they weren't any worse. In this environment, York fell in with a rough crowd. Gunfights, gambling, and other illegal pursuits consumed him. His life began to change, however, when he fell in love with Gracie Williams. Her father objected to York courting his daughter on multiple counts, and York soon realized that the only way to see her was to go to church. So he started going to church. On New Year's Day in 1915, he attended a revival service. What happened in that service changed his life forever. He became a practicing Christian and abandoned his former lifestyle. Naturally, Gracie's father was suspicious of York's conversion. York would not receive permission to marry Gracie until 1917, and then his happiness would be short-lived. In April 1917, the United States entered World War I. News of the incredible slaughter in Europe had long been a topic of discussion, even in the rural counties of Tennessee. York struggled to reconcile his belief in the biblical injunction, Thou shalt not kill, with military service. In June 1917, he filled out a draft registration card and claimed an exemption. His stated reason was, don't want to fight. This explanation was rejected as inadequate. He would try several more times to appeal for conscientious objector status, but all of these appeals would fail. On November 10, 1917, he was drafted. Still struggling to reconcile his moral stance with his desire to serve his country, York reported for service. After a few months of training, he was assigned to the 328th Infantry Regiment of the 82nd Division. The 82nd Division was supposed to be made up of Alabama, Georgia, and Tennessee men, but many soldiers from these regions had been sent to fill Southern National Guard units so that they could quickly go overseas. York's division was instead filled mainly with draftees, mostly from New England and the Mid-Atlantic. 20% of the division was foreign-born. Several hundred were not even citizens, and many of these men had a limited grasp of English. York stood out. 
He was one of the tallest, but he also didn't fit into any of the groups that naturally formed when the men were drawn together. He did not fit in with the foreign-born doughboys, nor did he fit in with the young men from New England. Given his disinterest in drink and chasing women, and his objections to fighting, he was not particularly popular among his fellow soldiers. He could, however, shoot better than all of them. When the regiment's rifles arrived in March of 1918, York was tasked with teaching his unit how to shoot. He did so, but was increasingly troubled. The arrival of the rifles signaled that the time was coming when he might be asked to kill. Again, he asked for exemption from service. This time, he met with his company commander, Captain Edward Danforth, as well as his battalion commander, Major Edward Buxton. Danforth and Buxton both believed that York was not a coward trying to shirk duty, and that he truly was concerned about his moral beliefs. Both men pored over the Bible with York, producing passages that seemed to indicate war could be justified. Major Buxton even laid out St. Augustine's concept of just war. York was impressed by this and asked for time to think over what had been said. Granted ten days of leave, he went home to think. After thirty-six hours of prayer and fasting, he decided he could fight and explained to his mother that God would protect him in the fighting to come. He told Gracie they would marry when he returned. Completely at peace with this decision, he returned to his regiment. A month later, York and his regiment boarded a transport ship in Boston and set out for Europe. York had never even seen the ocean, let alone been on a ship. The cramped quarters and rough seas made for a difficult trip, but during this time he also gained respect for many of his fellow soldiers. As he put it, the Greeks, Italians, and Poles, and New York Jews stood the trip right smart. That kinda impressed me. It sorta made up for their bad shooting. I sorta got to like them more. After a 12-day journey, they arrived in Liverpool. They then traveled 236 miles by train to Southampton, and from there they boarded another ship, arriving in France on May 21, 1918. In France, they were provided with more training and gear. They were then sent behind the British Fifth Army at Amiens. With the withdrawal of Russia from the war and the entrance of the United States, the Germans had been feverishly pulling troops from the east to send to the Western Front. The British and French had borne the brunt of this German offensive, and the newly arrived American troops were meant to back up the depleted Allied divisions while gaining experience. At the end of June 1918, the 82nd Division was ordered to the front lines east of Verdun. The sight, smells, and sounds of the trenches unnerved many of the men. York coped by reading his pocket New Testament whenever possible. Although some of his fellow soldiers harbored suspicions that he was a coward, his commanding officers found him a steady, dependable soldier. He was promoted to corporal and tasked with leading an automatic weapons squad. Within a few months, the division was shifted south to the eastern edge of the San Miguel salient a bulge that protruded into Allied lines south of Verdun and went all the way to the Meuse River. The Germans had held the San Miguel salient since 1915. General John J. Pershing, commander of the American Expeditionary Forces, wanted to reduce this salient and then move to Metz. He understood that such an operation would be a difficult task for the untested American army but he believed it was necessary to demonstrate the quality of the American troops, as well as blood the army for what would prove to be a more difficult campaign in the future. The 82nd Division would be a part of this great test. On September 12, 1918, in a driving rain, the San Miguel Offensive began. The next day, York's battalion went over the top with the objective of capturing the village of Noroy. They encountered little resistance as the Germans were already in the process of withdrawing from San Miguel. Later in the day, however, as the men occupied Noroy, the Germans fired shells laced with poisonous gas. By the afternoon, they were using the dreaded mustard gas. This kept York's battalion from advancing, but overall, the offensive was a success. By September 16th, the salient had been reduced, and the Allies were able to claim an encouraging victory.
The 82nd Division was then rushed to support the Meuse-Argonne offensive that kicked off on September 26th. York later recalled that he and his battalion were driven part of the way to the Argonne in trucks driven by French colonial troops from Indochina. This new offensive was to trigger other major Allied attacks along the Western Front, but it was very clear to General Pershing that the American Expeditionary Forces had the most difficult front on which to attack. American troops were literally set to face about 25% of the German Army's strength on the Western Front. They were also up against troops of great quality, because the sedan mezier rail line that supported the German army was within the area of American operations. It was virtually guaranteed that the best German troops would be stationed there to protect that vital supply line. In addition, it was also clear that the terrain would be challenging. In the end, the offensive would be successful and would play a vital role in bringing about the end of the war. It was, however, hardly a textbook perfect operation. German experience weighed heavily against American inexperience. By October 1918, the offensive was bogged down on the edge of the Argonne Forest. York's battalion had initially been held in reserve, but was ordered to seize the eastern slopes of the forest on October 7, 1918. Years of fighting in the area had claimed more than 100,000 casualties and had left a muddy, cratered landscape. York later recalled thinking that the area was an abomination of desolation. With little intel and no contact with the 1st and 28th American Divisions on their flanks, the men of the 82nd Division moved forward. 1st Battalion captured Hill 223 and tried to hold it against German assaults. York's 2nd Battalion was pinned down and unable to assist. The conditions were miserable, cold and wet, and York kept thinking about what he had read in the Book of Revelations, about the Battle of Armageddon. That night, 2nd Battalion was ordered to take over the attack. In the early hours of October 8th, the battalion moved forward, on their way to Hill 223. They were spotted by the Germans and slowed by artillery and gas attacks. They arrived at dawn only to have their own promised artillery support fail to materialize. The officers agreed that the attack had to continue, and so mortars and machine gun fire replaced the promised artillery barrage. This had little effect on the Germans. Nevertheless, at 6.10 that morning, York and his fellow soldiers went over the top of their fortifications. They were met with enemy fire from a variety of directions, but managed to move forward. As planned, the Germans soon retreated, and the Americans pressed downhill 223 and into the valley. As they entered the valley, they again took fire from multiple directions. Not only had they entered a near-perfect kill zone, but York's battalion was also attacking in the wrong direction. Earlier in the day, a runner from headquarters had been killed before he could deliver a message about the change in plans. Other members of the 82nd, however, had managed to get the order. They wheeled to attack in the proper direction. York's battalion was attacking in the wrong direction, virtually alone. York's platoon leader, Lieutenant Kirby Stewart, led the attack until his legs were shattered by German machine gun fire. Dragging himself along and waving his pistol, he encouraged the men to continue before he was killed by a bullet to the head. The attack halted and Sergeant Harry Parsons assumed command. Seeing that the American troops were taking the most fire from a hill to their left, Parsons ordered York and several other squad leaders to take out the German machine guns on those hills. As the squads began running for the hill, artillery began to fall around them. It was American artillery. Hours late, but nonetheless it shielded the 17 Americans who were trying to get up the hill. Over the next hour, the Americans slowly flanked the Germans. Coming upon a small stream, they encountered two German soldiers who ran back to their headquarters in alarm. With the element of surprise gone, the Americans chased after these two soldiers and burst upon the weary Prussian 210th Reserve Regiment. The 70 German soldiers, fearing that the Americans were simply the vanguard of a much larger force, immediately surrendered. As York and his fellow soldiers secured the prisoners, they were fired upon by other German soldiers of the 6th Company, 125th Regiment, who were higher up the hill. 
Six of the 17 Americans were killed, and three were wounded. One of the casualties was Murray Savage, York's closest friend in the platoon. Some of the German soldiers were killed as well. York was now the only NCO left standing. With him were seven other soldiers. He was determined to stop the killing. Pinned down as they were, there were few options. So York took a direct approach. He decided to eliminate one of the machine gun nests. While the other soldiers provided cover fire, he climbed the hill and crossed a supply road. Fifty yards from his position, he saw German machine gun crews in a sunken road. He took up a position and opened fire. As he fired, he shouted to the German soldiers to surrender, hoping they would do so. He killed a total of 19 German soldiers. Out of ammunition for the rifle, York ran down the hill, only to encounter a German platoon. The German lieutenant in command of the platoon ordered his men to fix bayonets and charge. Pulling his pistol, York slid down to the ground by one of his fellow soldiers who also had a pistol. Together they stopped the bayonet attack. York later remembered using a tactic he had perfected while hunting turkeys. He picked off the Germans in the back instead of in the front. If he'd picked off the Germans in the front, he reasoned that the Germans in the back would have taken cover. This would have made the situation far more difficult. This tactic eventually left the German lieutenant charging by himself. With just feet to spare, York fired at him and he dropped to the ground. York and his fellow soldiers had killed 25 German soldiers and captured 70, but they were still pinned down by the survivors of the 6th Company of the 125th Regiment. At this point, German Lieutenant Paul Vollmer, one of the prisoners, stood up and offered to order those German soldiers to surrender if York and his men would stop shooting. York was suspicious, but agreed. Lieutenant Volmer shouted an order, and another German officer stepped from cover and surrendered his men. With an ever-growing group of prisoners, York and his men began a careful trip back to the American lines. On the way, they were able to secure the surrenders of additional German units, bringing their total to 132 prisoners. As they crossed the valley to return to Hill 223, their fellow soldiers initially assumed that the large party was a German counterattack. They were shocked to see York near the head of the group. On reaching American lines, York reported the capture of the prisoners. When asked how many, he didn't even know, so the officers there counted them as they filed past. Because the group was so large, York was ordered to take them six miles away to another holding area. On the way to the holding area, York was stopped by General Julian Lindsay, the brigade commander. The general was impressed by the number of prisoners and exclaimed, Well, York, I hear you've captured the whole German army. The capture of the prisoners thwarted a potential German counterattack at that point. It also meant the abandonment of over 30 German machine guns. This cleared the front and left flanks of the American troops and enabled the advance to continue. York would not rejoin his unit until the next day. When he did, he found them about a mile and a half into the Argonne Forest. Captain Danforth was amazed to see him alive and to learn that York was the reason they had been able to advance. York immediately requested permission to return to where he had taken out the machine gun nests to see if anyone had survived. Permission was granted, but the trip was fruitless. He returned to his unit convinced that his own survival had been a miracle. The war continued. For the next three weeks, York's unit fought and fought as they advanced. Casualties climbed. On November 1st, the 82nd Division was relieved by the 80th Division. York's unit was the last out. During this time, York was promoted to sergeant, but all he could think about was the loss of so many men. About a week later, word reached the unit that the war would end on November 11th at 11 a.m. York did not join in the jubilant celebrations. He instead went to pray at a local church. On November 30th, 1918, York was awarded the Distinguished Service Cross for his heroism in the Argonne. Captain Danforth, however, submitted a request to have the Distinguished Service Cross rescinded and replaced with the Medal of Honor. 
This triggered a more in-depth investigation and the interest of reporter George Patullo. In February 1919, York took his regimental commander, his brigade commander, General Lindsay, staff officers of the 82nd Division, and Patullo on a tour of the battlefield. The officers asked question after question. None could fathom how York had survived. General Lindsay asked point blank, York, how did you do it? And York answered, It was not manpower, but it was divine power that saved me. The general agreed with him, and Patullo, sensing a good story, decided to write an article about York. Meanwhile, the staff of the 82nd Division continued to work on a Medal of Honor packet for York. The packet they put together was ultimately endorsed by General Pershing and passed along to President Woodrow Wilson in March of 1919. On March 20th, 1919, York's Medal of Honor was approved. He was presented with the award on April 18th, 1919. The citation read, After his platoon had suffered heavy casualties and three other non-commissioned officers had become casualties, Corporal York assumed command. Fearlessly leading seven men, he charged with great daring a machine gun nest that was pouring deadly and incessant fire upon his platoon. In this heroic feat, the machine gun nest was taken, together with four officers and 128 men and several guns. He was then awarded the French Médaille Militaire by French Marshal Ferdinand Foch, who told him that his actions represented the greatest achievement accomplished by a common soldier in all the armies of Europe. Awards from other Allied nations followed. In April 1919, Patullo's story was published in the Saturday Evening Post. York became a sensation overnight in America. When he arrived in New York the next month, he was greeted by massive crowds. He was also offered opportunities to cash in on his fame. There was a $20,000 a week contract to appear on vaudeville, a $10,000 book deal, and much more. All in all, he was offered about a quarter of a million dollars in deals at a time when the majority of Americans made about $1,500 a year. He turned all the offers down, becoming more of an American hero in the process. York arrived home at the end of May 1919 and married Gracie a week later. He wanted to live a quiet life and intended to return to his farm and ignore the rest of the world. But like many returning soldiers, the war had changed him. He had seen technological advances, and he had seen the differences between his beloved rural Tennessee and other parts of the world. He thought of his neighbors and of their children and worried that they would be left behind in an increasingly modern world. He would spend the rest of his life attempting to improve access to education in his county. His fellow Americans would forever remember him as Sergeant York, a reluctant hero. Thank you for listening. If you have any questions, suggestions, or comments, please contact Amanda Williams at amanda.williams at norfolk.gov.